Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 2, the level of Bhakti by Bhav. And today we're going to go into chapter 5. Right? Who would like to remind us of what we covered yesterday? Who would like to over go over some of the points? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam. Uh, yesterday, <clears throat> in chapter 4, we saw that uh, Parishit Maharaj asked Shukadev Goswami uh, mainly three questions that how Lord creates the universe and uh, then uh, how the Lord engages his different energies and expansion in the maintenance and destruction of the universe and then uh, does the Lord directly deal with the modes of nature or he acts through expansion so these are the three questions asked by Maharaj Parikshit and then in response, Srila Shukadev Goswami, before answering this question, uh, glorifies the Lord and uh, uh, wants to please the Lord through his beautiful prayers. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Right. And who remembers something about the prayers? What, what, what particular, what was the famous prayer we said about Sukadeva Goswami? His, he, he prays that all these people from sinful races can all be delivered by how huh? how will how will they ever be delivered all these people Hare Krishna, yes Maharaj. yes Ashraya, Ashraya, by taking the shelter of your devotees by taking the shelter of your devotees Apashraya, Ashraya, that is a word that is used in Shukha. Your voice is not clear, Manaji. I'm sorry. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Apa Shraya Shraya. By taking the shelter of your devotees. Taking the shelter of? Devotees. Devotees. Okay. Thank you. Yes, right. By the shelter of the then, devotees. Yes? Yeah. And then she further prays that, May the Lord be pleased with me. So yeah. he is requesting uh, for the prayers, for the blessings of the Lord, so that he can speak the right way that he has received. Yes, right. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. One of, the, one of the prayers I like so much, it is Yad Kirtanam Yas Pranam Yad Dikshanam, Yad Vandanam Yad Shavanam Yad Dharanam. By just a little bit of effort, you know, you can, by doing all these processes easily, one can get rid of all sinful reactions and uh, get the attained uh, love the body. Okay, just by a little, a little effort. You, what was the, the main point again? A little, just by a little effort, one can what? One can cleanse all the sinful effects and attain the love of the body. Get love of Godhead. Yes, just by a little effort. Yes, even once chanting of the holy name. Anybody who even one time hears the glories of the Lord. All of their sinful reactions can be removed. And uh, further, we also saw that uh, we should be above pretensions. Oh. Devotees should be above pretensions. Yes, they right. They should not be muktikami. 
they should not be uh, for sense gratification and they should not desire liberation all these things we saw yeah very good thank you very much very nice yes so you all have good memories okay very good so we'll go ahead let me see here chapter 5 the cause of all causes, right? We know the cause of all causes, sarva karana karanam, right? Lord Brahma's prayer. So, we're going to hear. Remember, okay, we'll see cause of all causes. Uh, so, chapter begins. Well, remember at the end of the chapter, at the end of chapter 4, it was described how Sukadeva Goswami was remembering what he had heard from his father Vyasadeva. And his father Vyasadeva, being a disciple of Narada Muni, he had heard how Narada Muni had put similar questions to his, uh, to his father Brahmaji. So, Lord Brahma had replied to Narada Muni and Sukadeva Goswami is remembering that. So the fifth chapter begins with Narada and his inquiries from Brahma. And then we'll hear how Lord Brahma describes the greatness of the Lord, the Supreme Lord. And then Lord Brahma himself will describe the creation, how creation takes place, and how the Lord enters into each universe, everywhere. So this is the main points in the fifth chapter. So here's the first verse, right? Somebody like to chant for us? Narada inquires from Brahma one to eight. Narada Uvacha Deva Deva Namaste Stu Bhuta Bhavana Purvaja Tadvijani Yajnanam Atma Tattva Nidarshanam Shri Narada Muni asked Brahmaji, O chief among the demigods, O first born, O first born living entity, I beg to offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Please tell me what transcendental knowledge specifically directs one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. Thank you. So, here's Narada Muni's first question. Please tell me the knowledge, that transcendental knowledge directs one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. So he wants to know, okay, <laughs> we have to read to verse number eight. <laughs> uh, my goodness. Let's see. Where's my... Have I got the text here? Uh, Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead, we'll read the other verses. Let's read text number two. We can just read the ink, the translation. My dear father, please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is the background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? Right. Thank you. Okay. Then text three. Sir, my dear father, all this is known to you scientifically because whatever was created in the past, whatever will be created in the future, or whatever is being created at present, as well as everything within the universe is within your grip, just like a one. 
just like a walnut. <laughs> you have a walnut in our grip. <laughs> There's nothing, right? So the idea is insignificant. And so everything's going on under Brahma's direction. Yes, text four. My dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? Mm -hmm. So Narada wants to know, what's your real position? Do you, are you doing it all alone? You create everything? Or under whom are you working? Right? Okay, text number five. Yes, ma'am. Mariji, go ahead. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. As the spider very easily creates the network of its cobweb and manifests its power of creation without being defeated by others, so also you yourself, by employment of your self-sufficient energy, create without any other's help. So this example of the spider is given, you know, we come across this before, the spider, how the spider can create a web from its own... Uh, saliva from its yeah from its own saliva produces a web and then when it, once it can wind up the web bring the web back inside again so narada is saying are you doing it all like that just like the spider without being defeated by others you yourself, by employment of your self-sufficient energy, create without any other's help. Of course, Brahma's not exactly doing like that, but Narada's thinking like this. Text number six. Whatever we can understand by the nomenclature, characteristics and features of a particular thing, superior, inferior or equal, eternal or temporary, is not created from any source other than that of your Lordship. Thou so great. Hare Krishna. Hmm. Thank you. So, Narada's glorification. Okay, go ahead, text 7. Yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you. When we think of your great austerities in perfect dis discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. Ah, so, a little doubt coming into the mind of Narada Muni. We wonder about the existence of someone else more powerful than you. Hmm. Okay, and then text number eight. Hare Krishna, my dear father, you know everything and you are the controller of all. Therefore, may all that I have inquired from you be kindly instructed to me so that I may be able to understand it as your student. Okay, so Narada is very humble and polite. And he's asking his father, Brahma, please just explain this to me. Tell me everything. Okay, coming back to the slides. Are you okay? Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, good. Okay. So here we have Narada inquires from. Brahma. First question. Narada's sub question we put. Sub question, right? From text two. Please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? So we're relating this to a similar question which came up in the fourth chapter. <laughs> mm. 
you'll recall from the fourth chapter, Maharaj Pariksit's questions to Sukadeva Goswami. We've quoted here, text number six. I beg to know from you how the Personality of Godhead, by His personal energies, creates these phenomenal universes as they are, which are inconceivable even to the great demigods. So how is it created? Just like Pariksha's question, very similar. I beg to know how, how the Personality of Godhead creates these universes. So similar question. So this is comparison. This is why uh, Sukadeva Goswami is saying that previously the same point, same questions had come up. And then again, from text number four, Narada's question, first of all, my dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? And then we have from the fourth chapter, text number seven, Parikshit Maharaj was asking Sukadeva Goswami, kindly describe how the Supreme Lord, who is all-powerful, engages his different energies and different expansions in maintaining and again winding up the phenomenal world in the sporting spirit of a player. So Parikshit Maharaj was asking about the different energies and expansions in manifesting and maintaining and winding up. So maintaining and winding up. So similarly here, Narada's question was like that. Under whose protection are you standing? Under whom are you working? What is your real position? So, some similar elements. Then, text number seven, Narada's question was, yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you. When we think of your great austerities in perfect discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. And in the fourth chapter, text number nine, we had Parikshit's question that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is one, whether he alone acts with the modes of material nature or simultaneously expands in many forms or expands consecutively to direct the modes of nature. So again, Parikshit also wants to know, do you do it alone? You did everything by yourself or you expand? How do you do it? So going on to text number 10, let's go back to text number 10. Okay, we didn't read 9 yet. Verse number 9. Someone read? Lord Brahma said, My dear boy, Narada. Lord Brahma said, My dear boy, Narada, being merciful to all, including me, you have asked all these questions because I have been inspired to see into the prowess of the Almighty Personality of God. Yes. Go ahead, text number 10. Then go ahead, Prabhu. Whatever you have. Okay, Madhichi, go ahead. 
whatever you have spoken about me is not false because unless and until one is aware of the personality of godhead who is the ultimate truth beyond me one is sure to be illusioned by observing by my powerful activities mm all right so here we have brahma introducing himself first of all he says to narada muni being merciful to all you have asked these questions because i've been inspired to see into the prowess so you can see brahma is actually pleased he says to narada you've been merciful to me by asking these questions it's very uh, pleasing to a devotee to be asked to speak about the supreme personality of godhead when the devotee gets the opportunity to speak about the glories of the supreme lord it's very nice for him it's a great pleasure for him he takes pleasure in it so he is appreciating narada's narada muni's mercy that he is inquiring from him about the potency of the personality of godhead right uh, devotees we should be grateful when people inquire from us right prophet purport writes prophet said brahma ji being so questioned by narada congratulated him for it is usual for the devotee to become very enthusiastic whenever they are questioned concerning the almighty personality of godhead and then prabhu said this that is the sign of a pure devotee of the lord and as in throughout the, then prabhu towards the end of the purport he mentions there uh, they want to see that the glories of the lord are known to everyone and prabhu talks as it the principle of missionary activities hmm? just like prabhu pad's pranam mantra goravani precharine preaching the message of lord chaitanya right paschatya desha tarini in the western world so prabhu pad took that on himself such a herculean task that he would go to the west to preach the message of lord chaitanya missionary activities on behalf of the lord that's that's the ecstasy for the devotees and so being asked also about the lord this is also very pleasing for the devotee then text number 10 whatever you've spoken about me is not false because unless and until one is aware of the personality of godhead who is the ultimate truth beyond me one is sure to be illusioned by observing my powerful activities so brahma was doing powerful activities certainly brahma is a, the, he's performing the secondary phase of creation so he's doing some wonderful activities very powerful activities so narada must have been greatly impressed you know creating the bodies of the different living entities and situating the planets in their different positions very powerful activities brahma was doing so certainly it, be, it would be wilder the mind of narada muni so prabhupad in the purport he brings up this example of the frog in the well which of course you must have all heard before the example of the frog in the well so in which way is prabhupad relating this analogy of the the frog in the well who is he applying it to other narada who no, scientists scientists the scientists Yes, the scientists. Why? Because they are not able to understand the inconceivable potency of the Lord. Ah. Because they think, what is this? This. That's all. They are not able to think beyond. All right. Can Can you give us some examples of the Lord's inconceivable potencies? 
what are like some of the... Instance, yeah? yeah, like for instance, when we say that these universes were created by the Lord, they say they are unable to understand it. They say, no, it, it was created automatically. Like, like so many things, they feel everything is done and they cannot understand the supremacy or there is somebody who is controlling or who is a creator. They're unable to do that. Yes. But I, and they're also not able to understand that. Not able. Can you give me some examples of things in the nature which are inconceivable? Thank you, Mr. Uh, the small seed, it contains the whole tree, and the tree can produce so many other seeds, so which is uh, inconceivable. Yes. Very good, that's a nice example from a tiny seed, a huge tree can come out and then that one tree will produce so many other seeds and more trees. Hmm. Every planet is floating on the universe, that was one of the inconceivable days of the Lord. What? Each and every planet is floating on the universe. Yeah, each and every planet is floating in space, right? And how are they, and, and they're moving in very carefully control, controlled orbits as well. So, Sorry. Sorry. yeah, every, every planet is, it's like they're in the hands of the Lord and they're moving in carefully controlled planet, uh, orbits and at the same time, each of these planets have also some significance, they have different effects on people. We see, for example, how the moon affects the mind of people. And some planets are auspicious and some planets are inauspicious. And of course that's the whole science of astrology, how these different planets influence the characteristics of people. So it's inconceivable how Everything is arranged that these huge planets all floating in space and who is holding them in position? And here we, have, here we are on the earth planet and it, we're, not only is it floating in space but it's rotating also. But there's no impression that we're moving. We're not aware that we're actually moving that the sun, the, the, the earth planet is in space, it's moving, it's orbiting and it's rotating. We have no impression of it. The design is so perfect. Just like you go in a good car, you go in a, an expensive car, you don't feel the bumps. And so here we are on the earth planet, you see, and we, and we don't feel the motions, we don't feel anything. It's so perfectly designed. Yes? Yeah, we can also see the systematic way the day and night happens, the rising and setting of the sun, the seasons, practically each and everything we can relate, that everything is happening on its own according perfectly as if timed. Yes. So there is, which others are not able to conceive of it. Yes, everything is so regular, there's the regulation, the day and night, and the, the seasons in the year, every year we have these different seasons. With, so everything, you can understand there's some orchestration or organization there. And what does that tell us, where there's organization? There is some controller. Yes, there must be some... There is some proprietor. There must be some intelligent people behind the creation. There must be some intelligent being, some intelligence there to arrange everything in that manner. So it's, it just does not make any sense to say that there's no God, there's no controller, it's all by chance. It's, it's just ridiculous. Sometimes we give the example, we talk about a city, you know, there's a, a big city like, uh, what, what's a nice city, you know, if we talk about a city like, uh, I don't know, Dubai, <laughs> you know, say, where, where did it come from, you know, 
Where did it come from? Did we just wake up one morning and there it was, in the middle of the desert, there was a city with all the buildings and everything was there with the water supply and electric supply and transportation and schools and hospitals, everything was just there, right? There was just a big bang in the night and we woke up in the morning and it was all there, Dubai. <laughs> you know, did it all come about like that? No, of course not. No, that it took intelligent people to get together and it took, of course, a lot of resources, money, particularly finances, to arrange everything and to arrange all the infrastructure. It was a big job. didn't just happen by chance. But the scientists tell us the whole universe all came out by chance, that there was a big bang and from the big bang we woke up and after the bang we find there it is, you know, the, the whole universe and all the planets and everything is arranged for each and every living entity. Hmm. No, it just does not make any sense. And we see there are also laws within nature. We see different laws are there. What are some of the laws which are there in material nature? Laws of gravity. The law of gravity, right. Just like the planets, we say they're floating in space. People say, well, it's gravity. Is it gravity? Yeah. But who, who, where does it come from? Who, who arranged it? Well, they say, oh, it's just chance, it's just there. Mm, no, it's some intelligent beings they arrange these things. Yes, another law. What's another law there? Law of karma. Yeah, law of karma. It's like somebody, uh, there is somebody who is actually judging and accordingly awarding either punishment or rewards. Yeah. So there is somebody who is looking into it. Right. Mm -hmm. Very good. And then? Change of season. Yes, well, change, we had that, yeah, we talked about that. Maharaj, the, uh, how the clouds are so light, but still they contain so much rain sometimes. Yes, right. The clouds, they carry so much water, but they're floating in the, in the sky. They're able to float in the sky. It's such a heavy amount of water, they're carrying so much water within them but still they're able to float in the sky. It's inconceivable. Hare Krishna Maharaj, even the Janma Bhakti Jarevati, the cycle we have, that also one of the... Yes, very good Prabhu, that's right. Everyone who takes birth, we're going to die, right? That's the law of nature. Jata Shihi Dhruvom Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, you take birth, you die, everything. Everything which takes a birth will die. The trees, the, the, the living entities, all different living entities. We take our birth and the law of nature is that one day we will die. And we see also how the trees grow up, when they grow, they grow towards the sun. They grow up, you know, they, they grow in the direction of the sun. And water, the water is flowing, like here in Mayapur we have the Ganga, the water is flowing towards the sea. It's always flowing towards the sea. It's always flowing down. It flows down the Himalayas towards the sea. So these are different laws of nature. So many... Krishna Maharaj. Yes. The, the gravitational force that, that is there on the earth and due to which the water is there on the surface of the globe, which is uh, rotating at the speed of 1000 kilometers and revolving at the speed of 67,000 kilometers per hour, but the water is still retained on the surface of the globe, which is a miracle. Oh, oh yes, very good, yeah, <laughs> definitely. The there are many miracles, right? How oh, all the rivers flow into the ocean, but still the ocean remains. I mean, it doesn't 
I mean, uh, it does not overflow. There is nothing like it comes out. All the rivers flow, but then it maintains its boundary. I mean, it is not that it's spilling over and coming elsewhere. Right. Is, yes. So we we see not only intelligence, we see also a lot of power, great power, inconceivably power, powerful. So it's very difficult for materialistic scientists to accept that there's actually a God behind this world. Uh, one of the big atheists is a person called Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Hawkins. He was a, like, I don't know if he still is, but he was a professor in uh, Oxford, Cambridge University or Oxford University. So he's a big atheist and he wrote a famous book, A Brief Encounter with Time. So recently one of our devotees, one of the ISKCON devotees wrote a book which has become very big seller in, in America, in, uh, bestseller in America. He calls it Stephen Hawkins on Trial. <laughs> Stephen Hawkins on Trial. The devotee is, maybe you know the devotee, he's a famous kirtanir, Vyasaki Prabhu. Have you heard of Vyasaki? He's a famous kirtanir. And, he, yes, and, and so, he, so he's written this book. He's, he, you know, he wrote other books. He wrote the book also about uh, Radha Damodar Vilas, which was a book about the Radha Damodar party and about preaching in America in the 1970s. And so he's written, he's published this other book, which was taken up by a publisher and promoted and become quite a big seller in USA, where he takes Stephen Hawkins to, to task, <laughs> One of, because he's a big atheist and a sci scientist, you know, scientists are like the Brahmanas in the Kali Yuga. We don't have, we don't have Brahmanas, but we have scientists. In the past, people would listen to Brahmanas and take advice from the Brahmanas. But in the Kali Yuga, we don't have Brahmanas. Instead, people listen to scientists and they do whatever the scientists tell them. So the scientists tell them to do things, you know, they do this, do that. And so many things, you know, you do this, they take from the scientists. The scientists invent these different things and and we tend to just follow what the scientists give us. And some, you know, motor cars, you know, airplanes, you know, these things are developed by different kind of scientists. And technology, computers and all of these things, you know, they come from scientists. And so, Scientists, are, they're always thinking they will control nature. And of course, nowadays, or they do research, they want people to live longer, and they try to find cures for disease and so on. You know, they try to cure one disease, then another disease comes up, even worse. There, there were some diseases like... Uh, they had some sexually transmitted diseases, there was AIDS, and then there was cancer. And now after cancer, now we've got this COVID, <laughs> you know, and it's endless, you know, there's so many variants on the COVID. It never ends, you know, after that there'll come something else. We're always trying to solve the problems of the world. And we're trying to solve them by our own means by our own material intelligence. But the real solution to the problem is to get out of this world, not to try to be comfortable. Just like we say, if you're in the prison, you want to get out of the prison. You don't want to be comfortable in the prison. We want to get out of the prison. So don't try to be comfortable in this material world. Get out of this material world. That's the real solution. But the scientists, they can't see that. So Prabhupada gives the example about the frog in the well, and the scientists are speculating, you know, 
How big is this well? How big is the ocean? Or the frog is speculating, how big is the ocean? So the same way the scientists, they're speculating about solving the problems of the material world. But one of the things which they do is uh, they only see the, the symptoms. They don't see the real disease. They treat the symptoms. Oh, the symptom is there. Oh, you know, symptom, fever, or cold, cough, hmm, this disease, that disease. And they're trying to co solve these, these problems. But they should understand that the real cause is not... You don't just see the symptoms, see the real cause of these, all these symptoms. The real problem is material existence that we're in this material existence and we have forgotten God, we have forgotten Krishna and this is creating all the problems. Okay, so Prabhupada gives the example about the frog in the well and mentions here. Similarly, the material scientists also want to challenge the inconceivable potency of the Lord by measuring him with their frog-like brains and their scientific achievements. But at the end, they simply die unsuccessfully, like the frog. So who else tried to measure Krishna? Who else made that mistake besides the scientists in Krishna Leela? Duryodhana wanted to bind Krishna. Okay. Duryodhana. When he went as a peace messenger. Ah, Duryodhana thought he could do it. wanted to arrest Krishna. Yeah, he thought he could arrest Krishna and take Krishna as a prisoner. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Brahmanji. Hmm? Bali Maharaj also allowed three measures of man, but he was measurable. Your, your voice is not clear to me, Mataji. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not able to catch it. Sorry, sorry, Maharaj, my speaker, some problem. Bali Maharaj also tried, uh, thought that three feet of land, when he asked, he was a small boy, but he was immeasurable. Uh huh. Okay, Bali Maharaj. <laughs> yeah, he made a big mistake. Brahma, uh, Arikshna Maharaj, Brahmaji. Ah, Mr. yes. Brahma. Yes, I, I thought Brahmaji, I thought that's a. The best, the, 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 the real answer to this question, that Brahmaji, he was trying to understand the, the power of Krishna. And that's why he took away the cowherd boys and cows, and he wanted to see Krishna's power. And he really got a shock, right? His oh, holy... Even Indra also. Huh? He tried to... Indra also. Indra also? Indra, he wanted, yeah, he wanted to shower the, he wanted to flood the entire city, thinking that, you know, uh, not, uh, you know because he was not um, honored, he was thinking of a Krishna to be an ordinary person, and then he tried to flood the entire place, and after that he got defeated. Uh -huh. Yes, of course, Indra's problem was pride, well, not that he was trying to, you know, but, but Brahma, he, his intention, he just wanted to see the power of Krishna. He wanted to measure the power of Krishna. He, so, I think the example of Brahma is the particularly appropriate one. Uh, we want to measure everything. How great is he? Is he so, it's certainly in, compare, in comparison to the example of the frog, I think Brahma is the uh, in a similar situation, he was trying to understand Krishna. His Holiness Jaipataka Swami gave a very nice example. He said, just like if you, you have a light bulb and you, you put the light bulb into a socket, but the voltage is wrong. You know, you, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a low voltage and you put this high voltage bulb in there, or you put the, the, low, the low voltage bulb into a high voltage socket, and then the bulb is wrong and the bulb just goes boom, you know, just, just like Brahma's brain. 
When Brahma saw Lord Krishna expanded into everything, Brahma was completely, his brain just, wow, it just exploded. He didn't know what to do or what to think. He was so bewildered. He had a, a breakdown, a mental block, a breakdown, seeing Krishna's full potency expanded everywhere in everything. So, Jai Pataka Swami's example was very nice actually. You put the light bulb in and the bulb just goes boom, you know, just blows. So his mind blew. We, we, we cannot understand the limit of Krishna's power. This is the point that he has these inconceivable powers. So Prabhupada gives this very nice example about the frog in the well. And then also in this purport, text number 10, Prabhupada writes, The question may be asked why Naradaji was not aware of the Supreme Lord and why he misconceived Brahmaji to be the Supreme Lord, although factually he was not. And so we may wonder like that, you know, Narada, he should know all this, he should know it. Why is he asking all this? But we have to understand that Narada is taking the position like an ordinary person. And he wants, he, wants Krishna, he wants us all to be enlightened, to understand the actual position of Brahma. And then Prabhupada gives it, he said, just like Arjuna was bewildered on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Prabhupada says, such bewilderment in Arjuna or in Narada takes place by the will of the Lord, so that others, non-liberated persons, may realize the real truth and knowledge of the Lord. So it, it was all an arrangement by Lord Krishna. Prabhupada would sometimes give the example about the mother Teaching, teaches the daughter-in-law by teaching her own daughter. Because the daughter-in-law is new in the home, she doesn't know the ways and she's shy, and she's away from home, she's sensitive. So the mother doesn't instruct her and say, no, don't do that, it's wrong. The mother instructs her own daughter and in this way she's able to understand. So the same way Lord Krishna is instructing Brahmaji and uh, Krishna instructed Arjuna or Brahma's instructing Narada for our benefit. They're doing all of this for us. Okay? Let's see. Okay, someone like to read this one for us? Hey Krishna, Brahma describes the greatness of the Lord, 9 to 17 verses. Specific answer to top Narada's second sub-question. My dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protections are you standing? Under who, whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all this, all entities with material elements by your personal energy? Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.11. Brahma says in this verse that this is knowledge and creative potency emanate from the Lord as his personal effulgence. Yeah, just a minute. Just a bit more. Yeah. The specific answer to Narada's principal question. Please tell me that transcendental knowledge which specifically directs one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. In this verse, Brahma reveals that his transcendental realization is inspired by the super soul. The truth is that Brahma is created and the Lord is the creator. Specific answer to Narada's first sub-question. Please describe factually the symptoms of this manifested world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And, and, and under whose control is, is this being all done? 
Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.18, Brahma states that the symptoms of the manifest world are three, goodness, passion and ignorance. Their fundament is that the pure spiritual form of the Lord. The creation, maintenance and destruction of the world are the natural results of his acceptance of the material modes as his energy. Specific answer to Narada's third sub-question. Yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you when we think of the of your great austerities in perfect discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.20 Brahma says that the modes of nature cover the spiritual perception of the living entities. The transcendental supreme lord, who is the real controller of all living entities, including Brahma himself, exists beyond those modes. The supreme lord is pure spiritual form, transcendental to all material activities, yet for the sake of the creation of the material world and its maintenance and annihilation, he accepts through his external energy the modes, material modes of nature called goodness, passion and ignorance. Srimad mm-hmm. Bhagavatam 2.5.18 oh, Okay, 2.5.18 Okay, so we're hearing how Brahma answers some of the, these questions of Narada. Here we can see how the creation is taking place, right? The false ego, the basis of the material creation. From the false ego, first of all, you have the false ego. Actually, the false ego will be influenced by the different modes. So, be false ego in goodness and passion and in ignorance and the false ego at the beginning of the creation comes along with the living entities and time and then the living entity in contact with the ignorance the mode of ignorance from that false ego in contact with the mode of ignorance will produce matter in the form of the five Mahabhutis, the great elements, uh, earth, water, fire, air, ether. So this is Dravya Shakti. This is the power of the material elements. And then these five elements, they each have their different characteristics. The creation, we have to understand, the creation of the material world comes about from subtle to gross. Actually, it happened uh, one time, the devotees, they, they had read something to Prabhupada, they quoted from the Bible. And there's a statement in the Christian Bible, and it says there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So Prabhupada heard this statement, in the beginning was the Word, and Prabhupada immediately said, yes, we agree with that. He said, that is confirmed in our literature also. And Prabhupada went on to explain how our cre- creation comes about from subtle to gross. Materialistic people, they don't think like that. They think everything comes from the gross to subtle. But actually, the Vedas tell us creation comes about from subtle to gross. So the first element which is created is ether. And within ether, there is the one element, one characteristic of sound. And with that sound, of course, to perceive sound, we will need ears. So the hearing, the sense object of hearing comes about along with the creation of the ether and the quality sound. And then after ether, then ether, within ether there's no other characteristic. But from ether, 
then in con further contact with the mo mo false ego in the mode of ignorance will produce air. And within air, not only is there sound, but there is also touch. We can feel the air. You put on the fan or you put on your air con, you can feel the air. So within air there is a sensation of touch as well as sound. Certainly sound is there, you can hear the wind blowing and so on. And then that air then produces fire. Without air there couldn't be fire. And with fire you have a form. There will be a big burning fire, a small fire, a little candle light. They each have a form as well as sound and touch. So these qualities are all there within fire. And then from fire, fire will produce water. And with water we have the taste. Krishna says, I am the taste in water. But water also has a form, it also has a touch, it also has sound. We hear the sound of water, we can touch water, we can see the form of water. And from water comes about earth. And with earth, the original taste of the earth, right? The earth has taste, earth sense. So all of these things are there. Oh, no. No, what is it? Within earth there should be odour, 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 smell, right? The fragrance of the earth, Krishna says. I am the original fragrance of the earth, not taste, taste of water. But the earth is odour or the fragrance or the smell or aroma <laughs> of earth. So all five qualities are there in earth. So, this idea is presented to us. Here again you see, from matter, again in contact with the false ego, in the mode of goodness, will produce knowledge. And in the mode of passion, will produce activities. Activities. Again, material activities and false ego in goodness, knowledge, knowledge, again, material knowledge, mundane knowledge, not spiritual knowledge. This is all due to contact with the material energy. And then, Jnana Shakti, Jnana Shakti, false ego in contact with the mode of goodness produces the mind. Oh, before we, but the surprising thing is that false ego in contact with the mode of passion will produce intelligence. So sometimes we wonder, well, intelligence is produced by contact with the mode of passion, but the mind is produced by contact with the mode of goodness. So it's, it seems puzzling to us. Right? How does it come about that false ego in the mode of passion is produced, produces intelligence, but false ego in the mode of goodness produces the mind? Because we think the, mind, in, the intelligence is higher than the mind. So there's one explanation which we sometimes give, which presented is from Ayurvedic Shastra and it describes that uh, false ego in the mode of passion produces the intelligence because with intelligence we, we see that people often in contact with the mode of passion we will, we will do things like accumulate money and save money and plan different things. Creation also happens because of passion knowledge. Hmm? 
Anything to create requires passion. So that yeah. is intelligence. Right. So that's the, the planning, that planning tendency, that, that, that is there, that's coming from the mode of passion. But the mind simply desires. You see, the mind desires. We, we don't plan much usually with the mind. We do things in the mind, it's more spontaneous. So it's it comes from the mode of goodness. So that's one possible explanation to, to, as to why the mind comes from the mode of goodness, but intelligence comes from the mode of passion. So here we see the diagrammatic presentation of the creation. Actually, Krishna begins the topic of creation by speaking about the, the three Purusha avatars from Karanadakashai Vishnu or Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu is laying over here in the Kajo ocean. And there's a, a corner, uh, the universes are coming out from his body. And along with the universes that are coming out, then he glances over it. And from the glance is carried time and the karma and the living entities. Of course, this glance is carried by Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva helps in the matter of creation. Lord Shiva is active, generally we think of Lord Shiva particularly in the work of destruction, but actually Lord Shiva is active in all phases of the creation. He takes part in the, the, crea in the creation at the beginning by carrying the glance of Lord Vishnu and impregnating the living entities into the material nature. He helps to maintain sometimes by killing a demon or two who will come and disturb the creation. And then his main function, of course, comes in the work of destruction at the end, with the annihilation of the universe. So the three Purusha avatars, we have Kar Mahavishnu laying in the Kajo ocean, the universe is coming out and then expanding himself, as Garbhodakshayi Vishnu into each universe, and then from Garbhodakshayi Vishnu, he produces the Garbhodak ocean in the bottom of the universe, and he lays down, and then the lotus flower comes out from his navel, and then Lord Brahma is born on top of that lotus flower, and Lord Brahma he takes up the work of the the secondary creation. But this is, here we see, this is the initial phase of creation, the creation of the different elements. And we see what's happening, that in the beginning, there's first of all Pradhan. Uh, pradhan is the unmanifested stage of the material creation. But from the Pradhan comes about the Mahatattva. And the Mahatattva is all of these different elements all mixed together. The Mahatattva is something like the Kichari. You know Kichari, you all know Kichari, right? When you, you mix your rice and dal and vegetables and everything, it's all mixed together. And so the Mahatattva is like the Kichari, or maybe you could say the Halava. Sounds a bit better. <laughs> halava. The Mahatattva, anyway, from the Pradhan, the unmanifested phase, comes the manifested stage, the Mahatattva. And then from, the Mahat, from out of the Mahatattva, the false, in contact with the false ego in the different modes, we get all of these different things. Right? Here it shows false ego in contact with the mode of ignorance, you get these different elements. And over here, we have false ego in the mode of goodness, producing the mind, as well as the demigods, the universal demigods, and the directional movement also. And false ego in the mode of passion is producing the karmindriyas and the jnanindriyas. 
the five working senses and the five knowledge acquiring senses coming from the mode of passion. So this is a diagrammatic presentation of the creation as it's described here in this chapter, described by Lord Brahma. So the, the last part of the chapter describes how the Lord enters into each universe. Text 34 describes, Thus all the universes remain thousands of eons within the water, the causal ocean, and the Lord of living beings entered in each of them, caused them to be fully animated. So the Lord enters into the creation and animates everything. Without the Lord, nothing is going to, going to happen. It's the Lord himself. When he enters into the creation, then things come to life. You know, just like in a business, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes maybe you work in a job and, you know, when the boss goes, you know, everybody relaxes. But as soon as the boss comes, then everybody's sitting at the table and they're working away and they're doing things. Everybody, you know, the whole office comes to life. And as soon as the boss goes, then everybody goes back to sleep again. I don't know, but it's often like that in businesses, you know, material world. <laughs> it's like that. Or uh, when I was a schoolboy, I remember a student, the teacher comes in and everybody's sitting very nicely and we're all attentive and listening. You know, before the teacher came in, everybody was just laying around and, you know, doing nothing. And as soon as he goes out, then everybody just relaxes again. And so, the same way the Lord is there. He's the one who gets everything to, to life. He gets everything starting to happen. It all becomes animated as the Lord enters into the universe. So, this section connects to the next chapter, Parusha Shukta confirmed. <laughs> so you'll go on to that, you'll hear about the Parusha Shukta. Parusha Shukta, right? You chant, do you chant Parusha Shukta? I think you do, right? You're all on a courtesy, you chant Parusha Shukta. If you're worshipping deities or maybe worshipping Shalagam, maybe you chant regularly. Yeah, I know in, in Dubai also, they were learning, all the men were chanting Purusha Shukta and the ladies chanted Gopi Gita. Anyway, the ladies can also chant Purusha Shukta. So the, the, word, the, the, the words of the Purusha Shukta about creation, how every, the Lord is described there in Purusha Shukta, will be confirmed in the next chapter. That's going to be... Okay, so here's a, a quote from, the, this is from the fourth chapter, going back to the fourth chapter, appreciating Krishna Lila. The pure devotees of the Lord, however, can equally relish the nectar in the form of the profound philosophical discourses and in the form of kissing by the Lord in the rasa dance as there is no mundane distinction between the two. Yes, no mundane distinction between... We have our material conditioning. We consider, you know, what is material, what is sense gratification and so on. But for the Lord, there is no distinction between the two. Philosophical discourses and his romancing with the gopis. So this is the, this is to help us appreciate more this topic of Shristi Tattva. You know, we may be thinking, oh, I want to hear Krishna pastimes, I want to hear Krishna Leela. You know, some devotees, they only read, they only read the tenth canto, they only read the Krishna book. They never like to read the early cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam. They don't like to read the 
uh, basic philosophy. They just want to hear Krishna Leela and hear Krishna's pastimes, which is unfortunate for them. Because we really do need to hear about how the Lord actually creates this world and uh, it, uh, it will purify us and allow us to have greater appreciation for Krishna's pastimes. Okay, so we've been discussing these chapters uh, from chapter 3 up to chapter 5. How did they flow? Would somebody like to, <coughs> would you like to tell us maybe how you saw these chapters connect to each other? What, what happened at the, in chapter 3? Do you remember? How did it end? From chapter 1 to 5, it gradually takes the person from Brahman aspect to the Paramatma aspect to the Bhagavan aspect. And the personal uh, form of the Lord is described at the end of chapter 3, the glory of pure devotional service. And then uh, fourth chapter describes about the uh, process of creation, how that personality creates. And then fifth chapter uh, describes the whole process of creation in detail. Yes. Yes, pretty much right. We heard... Uh, we heard Shonaka Rishi's... Where, in which chapter do we hear Shonaka Rishi criticize people who didn't like to hear about Krishna? Second chapter. Hmm? Second chapter. No. Fourth chapter. Fourth chapter. Fourth chapter. Fourth chapter. Really? Fourth chapter? That means we, we must yeah, have. The snake, 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 the snake, snake examples, the uh, example of the snake and the whole uh, the hearing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it must have been chapter three, wasn't it? Yes, it's the chapter, yeah, chapter 3, Maharaj. That is why he goes on to explain about chapter 4. Right, yes, right. Yeah. And so, chapter 3, we, Sonika was, he was really speaking powerfully and, and challenge, telling people what he thought about people who didn't like to hear. And then we heard about how he, he wanted, well, so Shonaka was a, appealing to Sutta, tell us more what happened when Sukadeva Goswami met with Maharaj Parikshit. There must have been a lot of discussion. What did they talk about? Right? And so then Sutta, so Sutta Goswami was asked like that. The Sutta Goswami, he'd heard Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. He was there when Sukadeva Goswami met with Maharaj Parikshit. So he recounted how Maharaj Parikshit was inquiring from Shukadeva Goswami about the creation, right? And then at the end of the fourth chapter, Shukadeva said that, yeah, well, these questions are very nice and my, uh, my, fa my guru or my father told me about how Narada Muni had asked these similar questions to his father, Brahma. And so I will explain to you what happened when Brahma met with Narada. And so this was the flow of these chapters to hear about this creation. Right? And then the overview of chapters 4 and 5. What happened in chapter 4? Sukadeva 
You were you chant very well, you ladies. I think you must do a lot of chanting. Anyway, it was very nice to hear you all chant Sukadeva Goswami's prayers yesterday, and we certainly we heard. And why was Sukadeva Goswami offering these prayers? Thank you, Maharaj. Busy. That time, you know, Parichit Maharaj asked the questions actually. Before answering question, he gives the gives the prayers. So here, for one of the questions, how does the Lord create, maintain and destroy the universe? How does he enact primary and secondary creations? And Lord activities are wonderful, inconceivable. He asked, you know, questions. How does he expand himself? These are the questions he asked. So before starting uh, answering questions, he started prayers to glorify the Supreme Lord. Yeah, why? So that the Lord can be pleased upon him. Yeah, he, he wants the Lord to empower him to speak, right? He needs the blessings of the Lord. Before we do it, just like before we eat, we also offer prayers to the Lord. Before we do anything, we, every day, of course, we should try to get the, pray to the Lord, bless me, please empower me to do some nice service today. We must always remember the Lord. You know, there's that, there's that pastime which took place in Jagannath Puri, the king of Puri, the king of Puri was supposed to marry the daughter, the daughter of one king in South India. But it turned out that this king in South India, he was actually not a devotee of Lord Jagannath. And he heard about the king of Puri, how the king of Puri sweeps. He sweeps for Lord Jagannath, he becomes a sweeper. So when he heard this, he said, I don't want my daughter marrying someone who's a sweeper. So when the king of Puri heard like this, it was an insult. So they declared war on each other. So the king of Puri went there and he fought the war against this king in South India, but he wasn't able to defeat him. He came and he, he returned home. He wasn't able to defeat that king. So he wondered what happened, why he couldn't defeat him. And then he remembered he had not gone to see Lord Jagannath and take blessings from him. So he, you know, we were actually just discussing this morning. I was giving a class earlier this morning. I give usually every Saturday morning to devotees in Russia. And so we were discussing about is it proper to pray to the Lord? to help you to do something? Or should we just depend on the Lord to do it? <laughs> and the example came up actually in relation to Uttara. The Uttara was uh, carrying her child in the womb when Ashwatthama threw the Brahmastra weapon. And she prayed to the Lord, you know, Pahi Pahi Mahayogin Deva Deva Jagatpate, you know, Please protect my child in the womb. So was this, was this proper? Should she have prayed to, or, or, or should we just leave it to the Lord to protect us? Or should, is it proper to pray for protection? What do you think? <laughs> and so similarly, we're going to speak, you know, Sukadeva Goswami is going to speak about creation. Is it proper to pray for blessings to, to, uh, um, to empower me. Is this the right mood? What do, what do you say? Yes, Maharaj, it is the best thing to do because we see throughout the Bhagavatam all the pure devotees, before they encroach upon any activity, they first take the blessings of the Lord, they pray to the Lord to empower them, mm -hmm. like Lord Brahma or Lord uh, even Arjuna or uh, Kunti Maharani 
and uh, also uh, that is why we have the Mangala Charan when we are uh, presenting the class before that we take the blessings of the Lord and the devotees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And well, also as a part and parcel of the Lord, we are completely independent of the Lord. So whatever we do, it's not our uh, independent uh, way of acting, but rather we are completely dependent on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are dependent on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, it also shows our submission and surrender and our complete dependency that we are nothing. Unless and until He empowers us, on our own we cannot act, we cannot do anything. Yes. And yes. in case of Uttara, even though she had such a great, um, I mean, uh, grandfathers, I would say in that sense, all the five of them, because it was her, hus her uh, grandfather, uh, her husband's grandfather. So in that sense, um, even though there were so many big Maharathis, she did not go to them, but she knew because she says, Nanyam Tvad Abhyam Pashe, I know nobody can help me except you, who can give me that shelter. Oh. So that was her complete dependency on the Lord. Mm. Wonderful. Very nice. Hare Krishna Maharaj. And, but uh, but also... can I just ask Mataji one question? I just wanted to ask you then, if she had not prayed to the Lord, would the Lord still have saved her child? <laughs> this was what the devotee was asking me this morning. I don't know. <laughs> okay. It, yes, Maharaj. If the Lord thinks or desires that the child should be um, protected, even though she doesn't ask for it, he will do it. But the very reason of us asking is something like it attracts the attention of the Lord. Like when a child is sleeping, when he cries out and he raises his arm, the mother immediately rushes. So it is that kind of a pleading and that attracts the attention of the Lord. It's not that he will not do it. Definitely, if it is for the well-being or for some higher purpose, even though Uttara does not ask for it, he would have protected. But then this, this automatic inclination or the flow of love, immediately it, it rushes to that direction. Mm. So that's why it attracts the attention of the Lord. Oh. So because it is I'm, said, I'm, yeah, sorry Maharaj, one, one more explanation also found, like people who say that I'm chanting, but they say I'm chanting in my mind. No, that is there. But then when you open up and chant loudly, that's the way to attract the Lord. So you cannot say that I'm chanting in my mind, the Lord knows, he's sitting in my heart. No, that's not the way. You have to open up your, you are accountable. You have to open up and say, so this is, the Lord get attracted. This we have to do it. Mm, thank you. Thank you very, and, very much. Very and nice. I think if I can add something, Maharaj, just like the way we learned today in one of the uh, verses, I think 11th or the 13th verse, it's it's the Lord's will. Maybe it's the Lord's will where uh, Uttara had to ask for it. Now why maybe just the other individual souls can also learn from that. But that's how we need to uh, take blessings from the Lord. Yes, right. Uh, we get inspired by that. Mm -hmm. The will of the uh, Lord. Maharaj uh, Harikshna Maharaj. But on the contrary, we also see uh, till uh, Draupadi uh, requests Krishna, he will not come to her rescue because uh, even when she asks also afterwards why you didn't come, uh, he says that I was in uh, uh, Dwarka just uh, because just you called me that time. Uh, after that only I was able to actually be staying next to her. But he says like that. That's why it took time. Why she said then she asked why why did it take so much time? He says actually I was in Dwarka. Since you called me, I had to come. That's why there is a little bit lag. So there uh, he doesn't come unless he requests her. No, that's. How should we understand these two? <laughs> so that you're talking about the, the time when uh, Drupadi's pot and she was feeding uh, the rats of He's talking about disturbing instances. Disturbing. Disturbing. But there is no such uh, thing like Upakata. It's all that is not given in Bhagavatam. Hmm? What did you say, Madhiji? Like what Prabhu was... No, no, Prabhu was saying that Krishna said, I'm in Dwarka, that's why it took time. No, that is not, I don't know in what, that is not no, even. No, otherwise, even otherwise, Mataji, unless she prays, uh, till then he doesn't come to the rescue. Yeah, but that is not the reason he gives. That is not the reason he gives. He says, because she was holding her hands across, 
So he says, unless and until you surrender fully, because tomorrow you may claim that you were protecting yourself. So to give that lesson that we have to surrender fully, to give that lesson, he tells that, not that I was in Dwaraka, I was in Mathura. No, but anyway, Maharaj, you please enlighten us, Maharaj, on this question. Well, I heard that he's coming from Dwarka to come there when, it, when that was the Draupadi's part, when Durvasa came with all his disciples that he came running from Dwarka that time. <laughs> but I, I don't know that... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so well acquainted with this. Yeah, I think you're right, Mataji, that the, the, the idea that she let her hands go, both hands raised in the air, and she called out, Govinda, and she took full shelter of Krishna. At that time, Krishna came in the form of the unlimited sari. So, yes. <laughs> Depending on Krishna, certainly we do want to call out to Krishna. We do want the chanting Hare of Krishna. Krishna Maharaj. And one more example that uh, comes to my mind is Srila Prabhupada's surrender in the uh, Jaladutta ship when uh, he had two heart attacks and he was very helpless. At that point in time, he also prayed and he wrote that prayer that I am like your doll and please make me dance like how you want. Yes. Okay, very nice, yes. Nice example, Prabhupada prayed to Krishna like that. Make me dance, make me dance, make me dance. Yeah, very good. What was the conclusion, Maharaj, in the morning in your question, in your session? Well, how we should understand, Maharaj, the question you had raised in the morning? In your class, the morning Bhagavatam class. Yes. If you could enlighten us, how we should understand. How we should understand what about which particular? No, you, 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 the question, the discussion was is it about. Proper to, is it proper to pray to the Lord uh, to do something? Oh, definitely, so definitely, question. it's yeah. proper to pray so to the Lord. Yes, we. But I, I was telling the devotees. I was telling them. I said, well. When Srila Prabhupada was ill, we asked Prabhupada how we should pray to Krishna. And Prabhupada gave us that prayer, Dear Lord Krishna, if you so desire, please save Srila Prabhupada. Uh, it, it, you know, because just recently one devotee left his body. There was one, my god brothers, uh, a devotee in USA, and he was a Mayapur Damvas, he also he regularly came in Mayapur, he had his house here in Mayapur, but he's from USA, and stayed in USA, and he left the body recently, and quite suddenly he was diagnosed with cancer and the doctor, it was fourth degree. So he put a message on the internet saying, please don't pray for my recovery. He said, just, let, just pray that I can... Uh, accept whatever fate Krishna has for me, that I will be with, uh, I'll have shelter of Krishna. And he actually died in very good Krishna consciousness. He chanted the holy name just as he left the body. He was diagnosed with this uh, fourth degree cancer. Two weeks later, he left the body. So, as he was leaving, he chanted the holy name, and he was really a good devotee, you know, he was really very knowledgeable and very humble and very uh, sub uh, very uh, active in devotional service. So I thought it was interesting how he asked, you know, that he said, don't pray for, my to, for me to recover. Just let me accept, pray that I will uh, have the shelter of Krishna in my whatever situation Krishna has for me. So, but we should pray. We do pray to Krishna. And certainly with Uttara, she was understanding that the child in the womb was very, very important because it was the only child, the de descendant of the Yadu dynasty, and he's going to become the king, and he has to rule the nation, and so 
very, very important child. So, and, and because it was also a sudden thing, that suddenly she sees the, 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 the Brahmastra weapon coming towards her, so immediately she, you know, she calls to Krishna. And she's, asking, and she's asking Krishna, but she's asking Krishna save the child. She's not asking about herself. So there's no, certainly nothing wrong in praying for others. You pray for others, that's not selfish. She was praying for the child. She wasn't praying for herself. She said, let that, uh, let that weapon burn me, but just save this child. But, yeah, we do, we, we, we do pray to Krishna. And certainly in a life-threatening situation, it's not against pure devotional service. When you're in a life-threatening situation, we can pray to Krishna to save us. And it's not against pure devotional service. That is described by, uh, is it Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur? Rupa Goswami in his network of devotion. Rupa Goswami itself it says Maharaj. Hmm? Rupa Goswami. Rupa itself it says Maharaj, yeah. Rupa Goswami says. That yeah. is a natural inclination of a devotee to call the names of the Lord. So he says, yeah. they are conditioned to call the names of the Lord, he says. Uh -huh. And particularly discussing in relation to a, a life, a life threatening situation. Of course, it shouldn't be every day that you're calling to the Lord, save me, <laughs> protect me. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be every day. But at the same time, we do take the blessings from the Lord that we can serve Him. And certainly before we give class, we do, you know, Gorgovinda Maharaj used to offer prayers for quite a long time before he would give class. He would speak for maybe 15 minutes, he would offer prayers. So I think it's, it's not against the, the Vaishnava etiquette to pray, to offer prayers, heartfelt prayers. That let me do some proper service for the Lord, to pray to be empowered, to serve Him, to please the Lord. Certainly, that's pure devotion. Okay. Uh, regarding the prayers, uh, also we learn the previous chapters, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 7. Chapter 7 from Arjuna, when he saw the uh, Brahmastra uh, coming from Aswatthama, so he he prayed to uh, Lord, though in such conditions, uh, very critical conditions, first he prayed uh, four prayers uh, before putting the problems in front of the Lord and uh, get the solution how to uh, contract uh, from these problems. Also, he put the uh, Arjuna also shown us the path. Uh, one must pray to the Lord before asking or uh, before uh, putting something in front of the Lord. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, we'll just go ahead, let's see what happened then. Mm -hmm. Summarize the description of creation. <laughs> Summarize the description of creation. Yeah, we looked at it briefly. You'll be doing creation in the third canto. It comes up particularly in Kapila Shiksha, chapter 26. And it comes up earlier also in the third canto. And so you'll see different descriptions. And it's not always the same. There's some differences here and there, but... Still, it's creation. All right, then yeah, uh, discuss the statement, Vaishnavas must be keenly interested in the pastimes as the Purusha avatars in connection, in his pastimes as the Purusha avatars in connection with Shristi Tattva. So we have been speaking about this. This is important for us. So we're keenly interested. We, we do want to know more. Understand the Lord. We should understand uh, Mahavishnu, Garbhodakshaya Vishnu, Shirodakshaya Vishnu. They are all Vishnu. It's not like they're three separate identities. 
They're just Vishnu. Vishnu expands himself into these different situations. And he takes on these particular names according to his position and service which he's doing. But it's the same Vishnu. It's one Vishnu who is expanding. Just like we have one super soul. There's one super soul but he's expanded everywhere. So in the same way Lord Vishnu expands himself. We call him as the Purusha avatars. But it's the one Vishnu who is expanding himself into these different positions. Then Prabhupada's mood and mission. Yesterday we spoke a bit about if the leadership of world affairs is entrusted to the devotees of the Lord. <laughs> well, I, I said yesterday, I said, well, you know, it's a bit difficult for us to do the leadership. But, <laughs> but here Prabhupada does speak about giving, actually entrusting the leadership to the devotees. So we make these politicians devotees. That's the point, that we want to preach to the politicians and make them into devotees and get these people who are really into politics and world affairs and who have that nature, get them to be good devotees. And we had the example we saw with Tulsi Gabbard Maharaji, that she's preaching and She's a devotee, and at the same time she's in politics. We're trying also to influence the other leaders of the world to take a serious interest in Krishna consciousness. And I told you about Prabhupada, he went to Mauritius, the Prime Minister of Mauritius was very respectful to him, and he bowed, offered full obeisances to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada told him he wanted Mauritius to become the first Krishna conscious country in the world. So we hope in the future that we will see some devotees who will also be leaders in world affairs. A Vaishnava, therefore, can accept a bona fide disciple from any part of the world without any consideration of caste and creed. On what basis can we do this? How do we support this? A Vaishnava can be made a disciple from any part of the world. You know, there are some people, you know, that. Oh, I'm not going to initiate anybody who, you know, if you have a, if you're from, if you're an African or you're a white body, I, you know, I don't want you, I won't take you as a disciple. I only take Indian people as a disciple. And we see even some Vaishnava temples, they only let you on the altar to worship the deity if you're born in an Indian body. You have to be born in a Hindu body, take birth in a Hindu family before you can get to worship the deity. That's not really according to the philosophy, is it? Yes, Maharaj. What does the, what does the philosophy say? Hare Krishna Maharaj, there is one of the prayers in the Sukhari Goswami, the 18th prayer, where he mentioned different part of the world, and the Kulinda and Andhra and all these things. In that he prayer says, which are sinful of creed, which are sinful of background here, but still by taking shelter of the Lord, that uh, one can uh, become uh, pure devotees of the Lord. Yes, okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Even, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has instructed, Yare Deke Tare Kaha Krishna Upadesha. So it is our responsibility to spread Krishna consciousness as a Vaishnava to all who, whom we come across. This is one of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's order. Okay, but can you accept them as disciples? That's the duty of an uh, uh, Uttama Bhakta Maharaj. Uttama Bhakta can accept them as disciples. What does it mean to be Uttama Bhakta? One who realizes Lord Krishna to be everything. One who practices and preaches both. When he understands the tattva of Lord in whole. Uh -huh. so, so, he doesn't differentiate 
main quality is he doesn't differentiate between anybody or anything he is merciful to all kripa sindhu prabhupad writes in the nectar of instruction about uttama bhakta is one who is trying to spread krishna consciousness everywhere one who is trying to dedicate to serving krishna distributing krishna consciousness all over the world that's uttama bhakta thank you thank but, you maharaj but it supports what you were saying also we also have the verse atari vishnu shiladir gurushu vaishnave jati budhi that just like we don't see the deity as a wooden object or a metal object in the same way we don't see a vaishnava as somebody is you know you're not you don't become a vaishnava by birth you have to actually change the heart we have to take up the service of the lord it's nothing to do with our birth or position some people say oh i'm born in a vaishnava family yeah your mother and father may be vaishnava doesn't mean you're vaishnava we have to we have to take on the qualities of the devotee it's not just simply birth we meet people like that south india you know oh, we are shri vaishnavas oh we are madhvas they don't do anything they don't chant they don't read scriptures they just became like that become hereditary of course it's a great advantage to be born in these families but they should take advantage just like to be born in a brahmana family is an advantage but you have to it doesn't mean you're also a brahman you have to develop the qualities of the brahman so we can accept disciples but they have to follow that actually prabhupad when he went to africa he told devotees he said the, he said i can accept these people he said you should be very cautious he said i can accept these people's disciples but if you're going to do it, he said you'll have to be very cautious because it's heavy karma we're born in these parts of the world we have different karma you're born in these kind these kind of bodies certainly we have different nature it's not so easy to become the boy you can do it you can do it of course but it needs training it needs that determination Okay and then we talked about Lord Jesus and Muhammad two powerful devotees of the Lord have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord Not everybody would agree with this <laughs> but certainly they did convince they they do have a lot of followers and they help to increase something of the god consciousness the challenges are there of course that the christian people sometimes they're not so open they don't accept other paths they say there's a statement in the bible jesus said i am the way the truth and the light no man cometh unto the lord except by me so they say you see jesus is the only way so they say like that they say jesus is the only way so they don't accept other people they're not they're not inclusive they're very exclusive and sometimes we get this problem also with the followers of islam but certainly the lord jesus and prophet muhammad that they did they did a lot for their community for the country they were living in but jesus tried and look what they did to him they crucified him and so it's it's certainly a, a tremendous service and then we spoke about the frog in the well analogy material scientists materialistic people they can't see belong beyond beyond their own little well and their own conclusion oh no oh, wait i think there's another oh okay yeah so that's it so are there any questions
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. It's a wonderful section uh, we had with you. And it's uh, we made the complex uh, topic into very simple topic. Very ledger the section, Maharaj. Thanks a lot for your a lot of patience with us and kindly forgive you if you commit any mistakes with your lot of speed. Oh. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Raj, I have a question. Thank yes, Maharaj. Like you said, um, you were explaining, Maharaj, that false ego plus ignorance is uh, Dravya Shakti. Uh, false ego plus um, uh, goodness is Nana Shakti. False ego plus passion is Kriya Shakti, Maharaj. How do we understand? Is it so? Uh, Prabhupada uses these, these terms in the purports. I, there's a, you know, these, these are difficult purports. I went through them. Uh, it's not so easy to absorb everything in all these purports. There's a lot of stuff, you know. And Prabhupada actually told Jayadweta Swami, who was his editor, he told him, he said, don't bother to edit too much my second canto. He said, don't bother with editing it. He said, just leave it as it is. So it's really not the easiest yes, sections Maharaj. to go through. Topic, actually. Huh? Very difficult topic, Maharaj. Every time we read, we feel that we have understood. But that again, uh, a lot of confusions. Yeah, I also, you know, I can't tell you I know everything. It's like Lord Chaitanya told Devananda Pandit, don't think you've ever understood everything of Srimad Bhagavatam. You know, Srimad Bhagavatam means Lord Krishna. So don't think you've ever understood everything in Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> it's the literary incarnation of Krishna. And certainly when we come at this, these purports in the second canto, you know, but some of the purports, you know, definitely they're much easier than, than others. And when, when you look at the translations, uh, the verses, they really, yeah, I really have difficulty with them trying to understand the verses. But Prabhupada's purports, sometimes they're okay, not so bad. You know, he'll talk about different issues. Uh, I did see in Buri John Prabhu's book, I was reading Buri John's Prabhu unveiling the lotus feet, and he spoke about uh, Dravya Shakti is the, is the manifestation of the material elements, Jnana Shakti, the manifestation of knowledge, and the Kriya Shakti is the activities of the material world. And that was all he commented on it. He didn't get into it at all. Okay, Maharaj. Thanks a lot, Maharaj. And extremely thankful for this wonderful flow charts, which made us understand this chapter, uh, this mind boggling chapter and the few chapters. But at least now we have a very strong base. Extremely, extremely thankful for your compassion. And the most importantly, you made it so easy and uh, your ever smiling face. In fact, yesterday I was speaking to one of my god sister and we were feeling very bad. In fact, we were feeling the separation. We said, oh, tomorrow is going to be the last session. So we are already feeling that separation and extremely thankful for the wonderful sessions. You made it so interesting and lively. And uh, the kind of um, fatherly feeling that we have towards you, uh, it's, it's, uh, we feel so comfortable and with, at ease, Maharaj. Extremely thankful uh, for you. And we look forward to many more um, such opportunities that we are able to be guided under your able guidance, Maharaj. Well, I also want to glorify all of you because I'm so happy, you know, you chant the Sanskrit verses so wonderfully. You know, my Sanskrit is so terrible, so horrible. I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a Westerner, you know. If I say a verse, you know, <laughs> when I'm in Dubai, if I try to say anything, they always repeat it because they say we couldn't understand. <laughs> My Sanskrit is so bad, so I, I'm, I'm so, so happy to hear your Sanskrit, it's so nice, it's so real. And your interest and your participation in the discussions is also very first class. I'm very, very sa satisfied. I really enjoyed teaching this class more than I've ever enjoyed a class. I thought this class is really nice. You're really, really with it. You're very eager to participate in everything. 
and I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to go over these topics with you. So I wish you all the best in your studies of Bhakti Vaibhav and maybe Krishna willing, maybe I will be teaching another bit later on. So thank you all very much. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. My heart feels sincere thanks to you because this chapter is very, very difficult for me to understand, but you have made it so simple. And our heartfelt feelings, our Sachi Mataji has already told. You are like our father now, and we look upon to you for Hare more Krishna. and more sessions. And your smile is very enlightening and it eases us when we speak Prabhuji. So uh, it's like you're a part of our family right now. And uh, as rightly said, we will miss you from tomorrow. So uh, please bless us and give your darshan uh, whenever possible for us. Please remember all of us in your prayers. Please uh, empower us so that we can complete this uh, Bhakti Vibhava session without any hindrance. And uh, thank you so much for giving your nectarian sessions, Maharaj. No words to say anything. We have sincerely grown to uh, love you and uh, uh, your sessions, Prabhuji. Hare, Hare Krishna. Pro the devotee said, said, don't love me, love Krishna. I won't be with you at the time of death, but Krishna will be with you at the time of death. So you should love and Krishna. And Krishna also said, one should love his devotees, only then he will bestow his blessings. So uh, it's a cycle. Hare Hare Hare. <laughs> so we, can through, we can go only through his devotees to Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Krishna means his devotees, paraphernalia, everyone. That's what he says. Okay. Thank you very much. Very kind of all of you. Okay, so we'll take our leave now. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your very wonderful nectarian session, a very good nice presentation from the chapter one to the fifth chapter. You make us very nicely realized from the uh, chapter one uh, the what is the best use of human life and also how to realize the God from the so, um, from, the, from the point of Paramatma relation and Paramatma relation, so nicely, wonderfully uh, presented uh, to make us understand very nicely and to this point. Thank you very much, Maharaj. And also, please uh, bless us, all our devotees, uh, so that we can progress in Krishna uh, consciousness very nicely and also finish our Bhakti Vaibhava class, Maharaj. So, so nice, we are again, we are seeking your. Uh, um, blessings and also seeking your really well presentations and lectures in coming uh, classes, uh, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I have made a, a small abbreviation on your uh, name, Maharaj. If by your kind permission, I would like to just share some of the points from unlimited qualities that we have seen. Uh, uh, I would like to just say that B, B, V, N, Swami, uh, B for bold in presenting the concepts, then B, virtual tour of the whole creation and of Naimisharanya, V for be very interesting PPT, and <laughs> N for nourishing uh, realizations, and S for simple and sober attitude, W for wonderful example personally, A for amazing realizations, M for mind churning discussions and I for inner purity was the force. So we pray for your wonderful uh, health, good health, so that you can uh, give us more and more of your nectar and nectarine realizations. And also, Maharaj, you are in the Dham. So please uh, pray for all of us to Lord Narsingha Dev as we were discussing. When we pray, we attract the attention of the Lord. So please pray for all of us uh, and uh, bless us with your kind uh, association in the future as well. Hare Thanks, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my respectful obeisances. Thank you so much for the wonderful class. In a very lucid way, you took us through the journey of the five chapters. And in the end of every chapter, the uh, objective, the understanding, you take all the efforts so that we assimilate the knowledge which you have given to us. Thank you so much and be free for us that we also advance and complete this course successfully. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for taking us through this uh, nice journey of Canto 2 from chapter 1 to 5. From the very beginning, you made sure that 
we are connected with the flow. Sometimes we read Bhagavatam, we read verses, we read chapters, we will get so much engrossed that we forget what has happened in the past and what is going to happen in the future. But you always may ensure that whenever at the beginning of every class, at the end of every class, you always made that connection. Before starting to, you summarize what happened in chapter one and every chapter you would connect it to the previous chapter and you would take us what is going to happen in the next chapter. So it was, a, the flow was continuous uh, and uh, of course your uh, sweet voice and charming voice and your smiles and the laugh so nectarian the words and in spite of being a sannyasi we never felt that we are you know, far away we were very close and we never felt also to uh, we are free to ask any question to you and share our uh, you know, uh, comments and ideas so we are really grateful and we always look forward to have more sessions from you thank you so much thank you very much very kind words okay <laughs> so thank you all very much Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, my um, respectful obeisances unto you. Thank you for making all these extremely hard chapters as sweet as sugar candies because it was very easy for me to understand. And please bless me so that I develop attachment to Srimad Bhagavatam and we can all complete this course very easily. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, thank you very, very much for your participation. We're always being there and willing to say, to speak. And so Thank you Krishna really Mahal. touched my Thank heart. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Maharaj. Thank you very much for uh, giving us your uh, nectarian classes. Uh, we really very well understood this chapter so that we can, please bless us so that we can remember this and. Uh, and give us your association. Please pray for us so that we can complete this course successfully. Yes, Krishna. certainly my prayers are there. I'm sure you'll all do very well. You're a very, very nice class. I think the teachers will be eager to have this class. You're such a nice group of devotees. Very wonderful. So thank, thank you all you very much. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for giving us such a detailed explanation on this such a difficult uh, topics, you made it very simple and the presentation of the slides and the flow chart, actually that is, uh, you know, the, even though it is so difficult, we were able to grasp so many things and, you know, uh, it was, it made us so easy. Actually, when we read it, it was so difficult and after it, after your presentation, it was so nice and especially as um, Gopal Kumar Prabhu said, you are linking it. So that also was making it so uh, easy for us and it, the continuity is to be there. So thank you very much, Maharaj. I also learned uh, one of the takeaway for me was that how humble you are, and you know everything. Even when Nadashuti said that please accept my, you know please bless us, you started on that day laughing. He said me, then who can be better person than you, Maharaj? So thank you for everything, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Krishna Maharaj, uh, my respectful obeisances. The whole chapter is like the walnut inside the heart cell but you are very carefully and softly broken the cell and you have presented that uh, that uh, nectarian walnut. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank oh. you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Very nice example. The walnut. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you for accepting us as your uh, students, Maharaj. And when I think of this session, I just can uh, recollect Bhagavatam very vividly narrated, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, very kind, very kind of you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dattavat Kalam. Uh, when we see you and have your association, we feel uh, the compassion of Srila Prabhupada, a glimpse of Srila Prabhupada's compassion we always can feel through you. And the tolerance that you have uh, shown for all of us, and uh, maybe many times we have not uh, appropriately spoken many things, but always there is a smile so we can we can understand how Srila Prabhupada used to be through your sessions Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Adana Uttana. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Ananya, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my um, uh, respectful obeisances. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful Nectarian session. I feel very blessed that I get the opportunity to sit in your class. And please uh, bless us with your association in future also. Thank you so much. 
थैंक यू मैरे जी हरे कृष्णा Hare Krishna, Dhanavas Maharaj, kindly accept my humble obeisances. It's been really your causeless mercy. At the very first request, you said, yes, Prabhu, I would like to do this session. It was uh, really such a <clears throat> overwhelming experience for me for having invited you for these sessions. I'm extremely thankful to you. And as all the students have expressed their love and affection, you will always remain our most affectionate teacher. as uh, personally i have also learned from you not only in our bhakti vaibhav sessions also in the bhakti vedanta sessions that you are teaching us i am extremely thankful to you and i always see you as a master of compassion and truly representing the spirit of shila prabhupada in terms of imparting the knowledge and uh, i also uh, definitely would mention there are many devotees all around the world who actually are very much hankering to seek your association and because of your very uh, humble position to impart the knowledge without any reservation and uh, with so much of ease and flow of bringing the prophets purports and his mood and his mission right up to the front so we are extremely thankful as this second third generation to receive the nectar directly from you which is all coming out from shila prabhupad's uh, heart Thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving your valuable association, guidance, and association. We request you to kindly pray for all of us and the success for these entire groups, understanding Shri Mad Bhagavatam properly. Thank you so much. So thank you yes, for giving me the yes, opportunity sir. because it it helps me also to enrich my understanding of Bhagavatam. Discussing with you, I got so much from you, from your how you respond to the different. questions so i'm very grateful for this association so again i look forward to having more opportunity to have your association that is so encouraging and kind on upon us maharaj certainly there will be another uh, sessions in the unit in which you are going to bless all the students here thank you so much maharaj thank you so much hare krishna Shri Prabhu Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare, Hare Hare So kind of you Maharaj Vancha Vancha Chakrapati Rubyas Chakrapa Sindhu Vancha Chakrapati Jai Shri Prabhu Padke